of course, there's been an arms race for the development of intelligence between men and women because each gender has to keep up with the other and women have their own dominance hierarchies. There's certainly no doubt about that. <coughs> and, of course, now men and women more increasingly compete within the same hierarchies and we don't exactly know how to sort that out yet because it's an extraordinarily new phenomena. The dominance hierarchy is part of nature and because it's so ancient, you have to consider it as part of the mechanism that has played the role of selection in the process of natural selection. And so, um, roughly, seem, what seems to happen is that there is a plethora of dominance hierarchies, especially in complex human communities, and many of them are masculine in structure in that there are dominance hierarchies that primarily men compete in, or that has been the historical norm, and that some men rise to the top based on whatever the dominance hierarchy is based on, and they make their preferential mates, and it's a good strategy for women to engage in because why, and, and many sorts of female animals do precisely this, is they let the males battle it out and then pick from the top, and or often the dominant males, there's no choice on the part of the females, it's the dominant males just chasing away the subordinate males, but with humans it's usually the case that the females have the opportunity to do at least some choosing. And so, we have, if you think about that, what that implies is that we have evolved to climb up dominance hierarchies. And then I would say it's not exactly that even because there are many different dominance hierarchies. And so the skills that you might use to climb up one might not be necessarily the same skills that you would use to climb up another. And so then I would say what we have evolved for instead, um, and I'm still speaking mostly on the masculine edge of things, uh, historically speaking, is the ability to climb up the set of all possible dominance hierarchies, right? And that's a, that's a whole different idea. It's like the average hierarchy across vast spans of time. And I think it's for that reason that we, among others, that we evolve general intelligence, because general intelligence is a general problem-solving mechanism, and it seems to be situation independent, so to speak. Those who act out the role of the victor in those standard narratives are precisely the people who attain victory in life. And, and I would say biologically defined in that they make more attractive partners, but also I believe that there's an alignment between human well-being, which is a very weak word, and participation in these meta-narratives that drive success because, well, do you want to be a failure or a success? Well, you know, it's hard to be a success. You have to adopt a lot of responsibility, and so you might be willing to take your chances as a failure, but I can't exactly, I'm not going to make the presumption that that's going to put you in a situation other than one where you experience a lot of frustration, anger, disappointment, depression, pain, and anxiety. You don't want a factual description of every muscle twitch. You want them to distill their experiences down into the gist, which is the significance of the experience. And the significance of the experience is roughly what you can derive from listening to the experience that will change the way that you look at the world and act in the world. So it's valuable information, and they can tell you a terrible story, and that can be valuable because that can tell you how not to look in the world, look at the world and act in it, or they can tell you a positive story. You can derive benefit either way, which is why we also like to go watch stories about horrible psychopathic thugs, um, you know, and, and hopefully we're learning not to be like them, although there are additional advantages in that, you know, Someone who, you might be some, say that someone who is incapable of cruelty is a higher moral being than someone who is capable of cruelty. And I would say, and this follows Jung as well, that that's incorrect and it's dangerously incorrect because if you are not capable of cruelty, you are absolutely a victim to anyone who is. And so part of the reason that people go watch anti-heroes and villains is because 
there's a part of them crying out for the incorporation of the monster within them, which is what gives them strength of character and self-respect because it's impossible to respect yourself until you grow teeth. And if you grow teeth, then you realize that you're somewhat dangerous and, or maybe somewhat seriously dangerous, and then you might be more willing to demand that you treat yourself with respect and other people do the same thing. And so that doesn't mean that being cruel is better than not being cruel. What it means is that being able to be cruel and then not being cruel is better than not being able to be cruel. Because in the first case, you're nothing but weak and naive. And in the second case, you're dangerous, but you have it under control. And, you know, a lot of martial arts concentrate on exactly that as part of their philosophy of training. It's like, we're not training you to fight. We're training you to be peaceful and awake and avoid fights. But if you happen to have to get in one, and, and I guess the philosophy also is, is that if you're competent at fighting, that actually decreases the probability that you're going to have to fight because when someone pushes you, you'll be able to respond with confidence and with any luck, and this is certainly the case with bullies, with any luck, a reasonable show of confidence, which is very much equivalent to a show of dominance, is going to be enough to make the bully back off. The worst of all evil predators is the human capacity for evil. And then at that point, you know, you're starting to, I would say, psychologize or spiritualize the idea of danger and making it, make it into something that's conceptual and something that's psychological and something that you can, you can face sort of en masse. I mean, one of the things people had to figure out was how do you deal with danger? And so you feel, figure out how you deal with a specific danger. But then because human beings are da so damn smart, they thought, well, what if we considered the class of all dangerous things? And then what if we considered a, a mode of being that was the best mode of being in the face of the class of all dangerous things? Well, that's a lot better. You get, you know, you get to solve all the dangerous problems all at once instead of having to conjure up a different solution for every dangerous thing. And that's basically, as far as I can tell, where the hero story came from. And the hero story is basically, you know, there's a community, it's threatened by the emergence of some old evil, often represented by a dragon. That's sort of typical, say, of the Lord of the Rings stories. Um, there's a hero, often a humble guy, but not always, sometimes a knight, decides he'll go out there, you know, and chase down the snake, maybe even, or the serpent, or the dragon, maybe in a, even in its lair, and he'll have a bunch of adventures on the way that transform him from, you know, useless, naive hobbit into, you know, sword-wielding hero, and he confronts the dragon and gets the gold and frees the people that it had enslaved and then comes back transformed to share what he's learned with the community. It's like, well, that's the human story fundamentally and that's, that's our basic instinctive pattern and it's represented in narratives. Women play a massive role in sexual selection among human beings so that <clears throat> from an evolutionary perspective, you're twice as likely to be a failure if you're a man than you are if you're a woman in that you have twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors. And you think, well, that's impossible, but it's not. All you have to do is imagine that every woman has one child, half the men have two, and the other half have zero. And so, end of problem, and that's basically how it works out. So, women are more choosy maters than men by a substantial margin. Ha! <laughs> there was a funny study done by the guy who established, it was one of the big dating sites, and he looked at how women rated men, and they rated the 50th percentile man at the 15th percentile. So 85% of men were below average according to women's ratings. Now men had their same arbitrary choices because of course they preferred younger women to older women and, and they were more swayed I would say by, um, by attractiveness but that didn't have nearly as big an effect on their actually actual rating of, of women. So anyway, so you know from a from a Darwinian perspective, nature is that which selects. So that's all it is. And so, 
sexual selection plays a massive role in human evolution you know the fact that we have these massive brains is very likely a consequence of a positive feedback loop in sexual selection you know because otherwise that's the only time you can get really rapid changes in evolutionary space where you know you get a process going that reinforces itself so there's a little preference for intelligence and then that produces more intelligent men and women and then there's a little more preference for intelligence and you know maybe then that turns into the ability to speak and or to master fire and then there's way more selection for intelligence and the brain just goes like this you know and, and women have paid a pretty big price for that because your hips are basically so wide that you can barely run and if they were any wider then you couldn't and of course the, the pelvic passageway through which the baby travels is too small so it's really painful and dangerous and the baby's head has to compress quite a lot I mean they come out cone shaped often and then they're born really young so you have to take care of them forever like what the hell you know a deer is born a fawn is born and it's like two seconds later it's standing and then it's running from a lion it's like you know it's like 15 minutes later and a baby it's like he just lies there and, you know, utters plaintive noises. That's all it can do. And it does that for like 10 months before it could skitter away from a sloth if it was predatory, you know. So, 